Hello and welcome back to the channel. So once again, I am trying some alternative op operating systems for the P11Z. And that's mainly because this is one of the best form factor handhelds I've ever had. And I don't want it to become obsolete. The P11Z has two gig of RAM, a first generation 32 bit Atom CPU with a passively cooled single core with hyper threading clocked at 1.3 gigahertz. This is combined with the GMA500 graphics controller, which in many ways is the Achilles heel of this particular chipset. It's worth noting that I have swapped the hard drive for a 64 gig SSD. There are loads of netbooks, mobile internet devices, and ultra portables all using this same chipset. On release, the P11Z came pre-installed with Vista, and when I've eventually done a video on what it's like trying to run Vista on here, I'll pop a link somewhere here or here or wherever it ends up. So far in my search for a better operating system, I've demonstrated how poor the full bloat of Windows 10 is on this chipset. We've also looked at Tiny 10 as well as Linux Mint. And I'll add links for those below. Down in the comments, Ashraf Khalil Ibram 3340 suggested that I looked at Windows 10 LTSB. Now, I'd never heard of that before, so I thought we'd give it a whirl. In addition, Caffeinated Human 4035 suggested that we try Linux anti air, so we might as well give both of those a go in this video. But before we get started, a big shout out to my newest channel member, Xantronics Industrial. Thank you so much for directly supporting the channel. So let's get started with Windows 10 LTSB and see how long it takes to boot. I have this handy GJ35 in order to set as a timer. So let's see how we go. So I've done a clean install on here. We've added Chrome, Softmaker Free Office, VLC, and I've installed the Windows 7 GMA500 driver in compatibility mode. I've also added some sample files, and to put it in perspective, it took 54 seconds for Tiny10 to boot to desktop. So it's slightly quicker than that at 43, so that isn't bad at all. In terms of footprint, you can see that this install, including my sample files and the additional programs, takes up 14.2 gigabyte. Tiny 10, to put it in perspective, was less than seven, and obviously I've got about a gig of installed apps and sample files. In terms of required resources, as you can see, the CPU is now idling around 5%, and we've got about 1.1 gig, or a little over half, being used at the moment. Just be aware that when Defender runs, it will spike your CPU to 100%, the only way to prevent that is to actually do a full scan and wait 20 minutes or alternatively to turn it off. So on this occasion, I've actually turned Defender off. Otherwise, it continues about 90% for over an hour. So I'm just going to minimize that and we'll pop it over there and we're going to launch TextMaker. So it takes a few moments to launch, but I don't think it's too shabby. And of course, again, even though we've got TextMaper open, once it settles down, we're back to kind of 4% CPU. And as you can see, we never quite reached 100. We'll pop an MP3 on in the background. Once again, I'm using VLC as my media player. And although the sound on this speaker set is absolutely terrible, you can see you can handle an MP3 playback while running Office with no issue. But what about YouTube? Let's launch Chrome and have a quick look at a Google search. So here we are. Let's do a quick search for the P11Z. So 
So that wasn't too slow. And as you can see, it's brought up a few options. And we'll have a look on Notebook Check. Just having a quick think. And that took significantly longer than I had anticipated to load, and but we'll see if we can scroll through it. Of course, we'll accept all of these, but mainly because I'm going to erase this laptop shortly. Well, that's a very cute looking notebook. Okay, so perfectly good for some light browsing. Let's load YouTube. Okay, well, it doesn't seem to have loaded properly, and yet the CPU is clocked back down to a reasonable percentage. So I'm not just sure exactly what it's doing here. Let me just jump straight to my page. There we are, 3.19K subscribers, go me. Let's scroll down a bit and find a video. So this looks good. We're actually getting the thumbnails pop up with little video clips. Let's try play a video. In fact, let's do this one. This is an old one. Looks like we're gonna have to get through the adverts first. While I'm waiting, I'm just gonna change the settings. Set it to 360p. And again, we'll have to just wait. See if it does it. Well, it's certainly trying, but I don't think this is at all watchable. So a bit like with Tony 10, I'm just gonna give up on this. So what even is LTSB? So LTSB stands for Let's Take Out System Bloat. Or according to Microsoft, it stands for Long Term Servicing Branch. Either way, this is a cut down version of Windows 10. LTSB has later been renamed LTSC. Let's take out the system. I mean channel. According to the Microsoft website, it's designed as a deployment option for special purpose devices and environments. These devices typically do a single important task and don't need feature updates as frequently as other devices in the organization. Essentially, it's a stable build that doesn't receive feature updates and is supported for about five years. Sadly, this does mean that while I'm using LTSB, 2015, it's been out of support for four years at this point. So there'll be plenty of security patches that are not there. The biggest issue of trying to use this version of Windows is that actually it's for enterprise users. And so trying to get a license for it is actually very difficult. I'm gonna pop a link to a video below which explains a bit more about this version of Windows and how you can license it as an individual. If you are enjoying this video, a like and subscribe would be excellent. If you you really like this video, why don't you consider becoming a member? You'll get a channel shout out, early access to videos, one of these lovely stickers for when you place comments on the channel, and of course you get the joy of knowing that your membership is directly helping the channel with purchasing batteries, accessories, and even new devices for me to share on the channel. So what about video playback? As I say, I've already installed the GMA500 driver in compatibility mode for Windows 7. Uh, it is a little glitchy, as you may have noticed, but here are my sample videos. So as I've mentioned before, on this chipset, MP4s seem a little more difficult for decoding, but we'll try this 640, 480 video first. And this looks pretty smooth. Let's skip forward to see if it looks okay. So actually, this looks pretty good on here. It's nice and smooth. Oh, perhaps the odd frame being dropped, I'm not 100% not sure that's perfect, but it's certainly watchable. If we try the AVI, and we'll skip forward a bit. And this looks very smooth now. I'm not getting any issues at all. We'll make it full screen-ish. And as you can see, the CPU is just hovering around that kind of 40% mark. So this is pretty good. Let's try a bigger video. So I'm gonna skip the MP4 because we already know it's gonna struggle. We'll go straight for the AVI version. So this is 1280 by 720. 
Let's make it full screen. We'll skip forward so we can look for frames dropping. Let's just try a different bit. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe. So the CPU is still hovering around kind of 50%-ish, 40%-ish. We've got a few dropped frames, but this isn't bad. I think probably there's a happy medium somewhere with 720p or DVD quality. So I've got NTX loaded onto my USB drive. Let's pop it in and we'll see how long it takes to boot. I'm well aware that this will be slower than it is off an SSD, simply because this USB drive won't be that fast. And we're in. So a little under seven minutes to essentially install from a USB drive, I don't think is that bad at all. Bear in mind the only other Linux I have used is Mint and I was very pleased with Mint. It had everything you needed straight out of the box and it ran pretty darn fast. So we're just gonna pop through. I'm gonna go to applications, office, and we're just gonna boot LibreOffice Writer, same as we did text maker, we'll see how long it takes. And the answer is not very long, so that was pretty snappy really. Make this nice and big. I do think it's great that Linux usually includes LibreOffice as standard. And as you can see, it's quite snappy. So I've plugged in a second USB stick, which you'll have noticed here, and this has got some files on it. So if we go to the file manager, just here. Here we are is an mp3. So we'll just see if that plays. So other than the um, terrible tinny speakers, it sounds pretty good. And if we pop out of here, the resource meter is showing us that actually the CPU is not trying that hard. So this is all good. We'll come out of there. I'll just close this down and no i don't think i'll save it and we're going to try playing a video so this is a vga avi file and it's attempting to play it and it's crashed so we'll try the mp4 but last time i did this the same thing happened i've been quite unsuccessful at getting any kind of video playback on here and there we go, crashed again. So that's a real shame. I'm sure if I found the right application or perhaps the correct codex that this would work fine. But as I say, I'm unfamiliar with Linux, so I've not been able to do that. Please feel free to pop your suggestions below. So I've set it to 360p. So it's very jerky. It's playing better than it did in Windows 10, except of course, there isn't actually any sound. So we're not gonna be watching videos on here. I think you're best just using your phone. So Anti-X has performed admirably on this system with the exception of video playback. Now, as I alluded to before, I'm hopeful that one of you boffins can point me in the right direction of a better media player or perhaps improve codex that will allow media playback on here. Other than that, Office works great, light internet browsing is perfectly acceptable, and I had none of the MP3 playback issues that I experienced when using Mint. In comparison to Mint, I feel Anti-X has run much faster on this system, especially when it comes to using the GUI, and much more responsive when opening new files and programs. The other thing worth mentioning when it comes to the differences between Mint and Anti-X is that unlike Mint, which ceased 32-bit development in 2019, Anti-X is still developing for 32-bit computers, with the latest release being February of this year. There is a note on the website though that does point Point out that other developers aren't necessarily continuing development in 32-bit software. Perhaps we are at the sunset of 32-bit computing. If Linux doesn't cut it for you, then I would strongly recommend giving LTSB a go. I have been using 2015, and that's mainly because if I install a later edition, it comes with more features, which means more bloat. And we're trying to get it to run on a very low spec system. It was significantly faster than using Tiny10, and it was light years ahead of using full-blown Windows 10. It really could be the best version of Windows 10 out there. That said, 
as I've already mentioned, there are licensing issues. But I guess if you could live with having that warning in the corner saying it's not registered, then, you know, maybe carry on. Otherwise, check out the video I linked below. And Chris does talk about just how to register it as an individual user. Just bear in mind if you are using an older version of LTSB, such as 2015, that I've shown you today, then of course there's no security support. So you do need to be careful about people using backdoors to access your computer. That said, if they're trying to mine for crypto, they're really not going to get very far on this system. It's clear from installing different operating systems on this device that the real Achilles heel isn't the RAM or even that lowly Atom CPU, but is the GMA500. If that was working properly, video playback would be smooth. I mean, theoretically, that chip can carry two streams simultaneously of full HD. In practice, it struggles with 720p AVI files, so, you know, not so great. I have tried a couple of other Linux builds. I put a Puppy on here earlier today. That was fine, except I couldn't actually connect to the internet as it didn't recognize my Wi-Fi driver. And I did try Debenham and it crashed a couple of times. So I think I'm probably done with trying different operating systems on here, unless you have any amazing suggestions, in which case, pop a comment below. Otherwise, next time you see this, it will be holding Vista and we'll be doing a video on what it was like when it was new. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and a thumbs up. If you've got anything you think I've missed or should add, pop a comment below. I hope that I've helped you breathe some life into your older netbook. As always, my name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.